Hi there and welcome to our channel. Today, we're going to be exploring the world of medieval jewelry. From ornate crowns and sparkling gemstones to intricate metalwork and symbolic motifs, medieval jewelry was a vital part of daily life and culture during the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages were a 1,000-year period that was typically restricted to Europe and the Byzantine Empire. Material remains from that time, like jewelry, can be very different depending on where and when they were made. This is because Christianity discouraged burying jewelry as grave goods, except for royalty and important clerics, who were often buried in their best clothes and wearing jewels. Gold was the main material used to make jewelry from ancient times until the Middle Ages. One soldering, plating, and gilding, repousse, chasing, inlay, enameling, filigree and granulation, stamping, striking, and casting were among the techniques used to create working surfaces and add decoration to those surfaces in order to produce the jewelry. The Barbarian, Byzantine, Carolingian, Ottoman, Viking, and Late Middle Ages were major stylistic phases when Western European styles became relatively similar. Most styles and techniques used in personal adornment jewelry, the main subject of this article, were also used in pieces of decorated metalwork, which was the most prestigious form of art for the majority of this period these were often much larger. Most of the things that have survived are religious items like reliquaries, church plates with chalices and other pieces, crosses like the Cross of Lothair, and treasure-bound books. However, this is largely a result of survival, as the church has proven to be far better at preserving its treasures than secular or civic elites, and there may have been just as many secular objects made in the same styles at the time. For example, the Royal Gold Cup, a secular cup decorated with religious imagery, is one of only a few survivors of the Valois dynasty's vast collection of metalwork jewels that ruled France in the late Middle Ages. In addition to the basic forms of personal jewelry that are still in use today, such as rings, necklaces, bracelets, and brooches, medieval jewelry often includes a variety of other forms less commonly found in modern jewelry, such as fittings and fasteners for clothes, such as buckles, points for the ends of laces, and buttons by the end of the period as well as decorations for belts, weapons, purses, and other accessories, and decorated pins, mostly for holding hairstyles. Neck chains held a variety of pendants, ranging from crosses, the most common, to lockets and elaborate gem set pieces. Thin fillets or strips of flexible gold sheet, often embellished, were most likely sewn into hair or headdresses. Arm rings, armalay, and occasionally ankle rings were also worn, and for the very wealthy, many small pieces of jewelry were sewn into the fabric of garments, forming patterns. Jewelry was a major indicator of social status, and most prosperous women probably wore some noticeable pieces all the time, or at least whenever they left the house. Men were frequently equally adorned, and high-status children of both sexes frequently wore jewelry as formal wear. The Raw Materials Metals of Value For thousands of years, gold has captivated mankind. By the end of the 4th millennium BCE, it had already been worked on and refined with great technical skill. Leaving aside its beauty and possible association with the sun's perceived mystical powers, the main benefit of using gold to create jewelry was its malleability. The Romans were voracious producers and consumers of gold, nearly depleting European reserves. Some gold mined in West Africa, especially near the end of the period, most likely made its way to Europe via the Islamic world but the main source was undoubtedly ancient Roman gold that remained above ground in coin or object form or was recovered from buried hoards. Gold was in short supply at several points during the period, and European gold coinage was unusual throughout, in contrast to the Byzantine and Islamic worlds. During the Middle Ages, silver was mined throughout Europe, with large deposits discovered in Kutnal Hora, Bohemia, in 1848 that lasted until the end of the period. Gemstones Almost all gemstones had to be imported from outside Europe, though native stones were used in insular jewelry. Amber, jet, freshwater pearls, and coral were discovered in Europe. Prior to the development of the modern facet-cut style of gem cutting, all stones were cut and polished in variations of what is now known as a cabochon cut, with rounded contours. Other stones, such as ruby and emerald, were the most highly prized, but a wide range of stones were used with modern distinctions between precious and semi-precious stones largely ignored and clear rock crystal, sometimes engraved, popular. Large stones were highly valued, and many rulers and great nobles amassed collections that were reset on a regular basis. Lapidaries, or books listing various gems, were a very popular type of work in the Middle Ages, 
because they listed the many medical and quasi-magical powers attributed to gems, as well as their religious symbolism and, in some cases, their astrological significance. Sapphires, for example, were said to have magical properties capable of detecting fraud, curing snake bites, and driving out witchcraft. In early medieval jeweled objects, ancient engraved gems were frequently reused among stones, which were often set profusely, spaced out across surfaces, and mixed with gold ornaments. The full skills of classical gem engravers were only recaptured at the end of the period, but simpler inscriptions and motifs were sometimes added earlier. Pearls collected in the wild from the Holarctic freshwater pearl mussel were widely used, with Scotland serving as a major source. However, this species is now threatened in most areas. Adhesives. To adhere precious metal foils to wood or any other support that served as the foundation for the work of art, various adhesives were used. In Book 3, Chapter Licks of his treatise, titled De Confection Qui Dissitur Tenax, Theophilus mentions a Confectio Tenax preparation. The material mentioned by Theophilus should serve two functions, adhesive and filling. According to current analytical evidence, it also has a double composite chemical nature. The inorganic part forms the inert mass on which metals work and can be made of sand, clay, powdered bricks and tiles, or the so-called coccio pesto, powdered bricks mixed with mortar, while the organic part acts as an adhesive between metal and wood and is made of wax and or pitch. Northern European styles during the migration period. Barbarian jewelry from the migration period is one of the most common forms of surviving art from their cultures, and personal adornment of the elite was clearly valued, both for men and women. As the barbarian peoples, including the Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Franks, Anglo-Saxons, and Lombards, took over the territories of the Western Roman Empire, large jeweled fibula brooches, worn singly, with a cloak, or in pairs, for many types of women's dress, were made in a variety of forms based on Roman styles. These and other jewels frequently used gold and garnet clazonet, a technique that created patterns by laying thin chips of garnet and other stones into small gold cells. Enamel was used in the same style at times, often as a cheaper substitute for the stones. The penanula brooch was the preferred shape in British Isles insular art, and exceptionally large and elaborate examples such as the Tara brooch and Hunterston brooch were worn by both secular elites and clergy, at least on liturgical vestments. Few other types of jewellery from this location and time period have survived. The wearing of less expensive jewellery appears to have spread quite far down the social scale. Gold was relatively inexpensive at the time. The Anglo-Saxons who established the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of England preferred round disc brooches to fibulae or penanular forms, as well as gold and garnet clazonet and other styles. The finest and most famous collection of barbarian jewellery is the set for the adornment of, probably, an Anglo-Saxon king of about six, discovered in the mid-20th century at the Sutton Hoo burial site in England. Ottoman, Carolingian, and Byzantine. Even in pieces intended for secular use, Byzantine Empire jewellery frequently featured religious images or motifs, such as the cross. Elaborate Roman styles were maintained, but with a greater emphasis on clazonet enamel. The court or the church were the primary commissioning bodies for gold work and jewellery. As a result, much of the jewellery was religious in nature, with ornate crosses and depictions of the afterlife or saints' lives. The Byzantines were masters of inlay, and their work was opulent involving precious stones, glass, and gold. Much of the truly extravagant jewellery depicted in mosaics and paintings has vanished as a result of the end of burying a person's jewellery with them during this time period. Sixteen Carolingian jewellery is similar to Byzantine jewellery in that almost all of it has been lost to modern times, with the exception of religious jewellery. In their love of colour, the Carolingians were similar to the barbarians, but the techniques they used, particularly enamelling, are much more reminiscent of the Byzantines. The crown of Charlemagne, with precious stones, filigree, enamel, and gold, is the most outstanding piece of jewellery that has survived from this period. Again, the Ottoman style is very similar to that of the Byzantines and Carolingians. Religion plays a significant role in the jewellery that has survived. Ottoman style is a hybrid of German and Byzantine elements, superior in both technicality and delicacy. Viking. Viking jewellery began simply, with plain bands and rings but quickly evolved into intricate and masterful artistry, with a strong preference for silver, which was unusual in the Middle Ages. Filigree and repoussé were the two most popular Viking techniques. The main themes in Viking jewellery are patterns of nature and animals, which became more abstract as time passed. 
Later Viking jewelry is characterized by simple geometric patterns. The most intricate Viking work discovered is a pair of bands from the 6th century found in Alleberg, Sweden. Barbarian jewelry was very similar to Viking jewelry, with many of the same themes. Geometric and abstract patterns were prevalent in barbarian art. Viking women, like other barbarian women, required jewelry to keep their clothes on and were probably rarely seen without it. Late Middle Ages In the Late Middle Ages jewelry became the domain of aristocratic and noble houses in the 13th century, with sumptuary laws prohibiting commoners from wearing jewelry containing precious stones, pearls, or excessive amounts of gold or silver. Royal treasury inventories show hundreds of pieces of intricate, elaborate jewelry, such as brooches, rings, and jeweled belts. Simultaneously, there was some simpler work, using intricately worked gold but without the precious stones. By the end of the period, the types of personal jewelry worn by wealthy women were not dissimilar to those seen today, with rings, necklaces, brooches, lockets, and, less frequently, earrings all being popular. However, accessories such as belts and purses, as well as other personal items such as combs and book covers, may be jeweled in a way that is rarely seen today. Poorer women, like today, wore fewer pieces of similar styles of personal jewelry made of cheaper materials. Wealthy men wore far more jewelry than we do today, often including large chain collars and an extravagant cap badge. Techniques Due to ancient tradition and knowledge of how to process gold to produce jewelry, the practice of gold being the base for all jewelry continued into the Middle Ages. Plating, gilding, and soldering. For jewelry design, goldsmiths used soldering, plating, and gilding techniques to create a larger workable surface or to cover a secondary metal with a thin layer of gold. The goldsmith would begin with a gold ingot, which would then be hammered into a gold sheet, foil, or leaf. Soldering is the process of joining multiple sheets of metal together to form a single, larger piece. This was accomplished by using a more impure form of gold as a joining tool, that is, one with a higher percentage of non-gold metals. Because the higher the impurity of gold, the faster it melts, the impure gold would melt before the pure and could then be used to join two or more pieces of purer gold. This would result in a larger surface while keeping the thickness of the gold sheets the same. Gold sheets could be hammered thin, gold foil was roughly the thickness of a piece of paper, and gold leaf could be as thin as 0.005 mm. Gold foil was hammered or smoothed over a core of glass or another metal during the plating process. Gilding was done with gold leaf adhered or pressed onto a terracotta or metal base, such as copper. Both of these techniques enabled jewelry to have the appearance and prestige of gold while avoiding the use of solid gold, which was scarce and expensive. Edit with repoussé, inlay, enameling, filigree, and granulation to achieve delicate metalwork, jewelers used delicate methods. These techniques required more precise work to create ornamentation on jewelry. Repoussé was the process of forming a pattern by laying a gold sheet on pitch and applying concentrated pressure. Under the gold, other materials such as soft wood, lead, and wax could be used. These malleable materials supported and held the gold in place while it was patterned and pushed into grooves in the base material to form the relief that created the jewelry. Inlay and enameling were two techniques used by jewelers to incorporate gems, glass, and other metals into jewelry. The primary distinction between these methods is that inlay can refer to any material inserted into a design, whereas enamel specifically refers to pieces of a colored glass mixture placed in place while melted. The decorative pieces would be inserted into a gold setting made of gold strips, or molten glass could be poured into contours and recesses in the gold, known as cloisonné and champelvé, respectively. Filigree and granulation are two closely related processes. They involve the decoration of a sheet of gold with wires or gold grains that can be worked into very intricate patterns. Because the wires or grains could be easily worked into twisted patterns and minuscule facets, these techniques allowed for a high level of detail and delicacy. All of these techniques allowed for detailed work on gold jewelry, such as the addition of other materials or fine details. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the history and beauty of medieval jewelry. We hope you enjoyed learning about the rich traditions and artistic skills of the time period. If you liked this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more informative and entertaining content. Until next time, goodbye.